begin our session by understanding project scope management. In our earlier session, we saw that the project management consists of nine knowledge areas, namely the scope, schedule, cost, quality and you know HR, procurement, risk and communications management. The last area of course, being the integration management. The project scope management pertains to defining what the project will produce. A project generally results in producing a single product consisting of many components. For instance, if you take a telephone system, it will have hardware, software, training, implementation and many other small things. So, project scope management involves defining and of course, subsequently controlling what is and what is not included in the project. That is, what products will the project produce and how those products will be produced. It is obvious at this particular stage that all stakeholders must agree with the project's scope. Now, if you look at the project scope management process, it consists of different sub processes. Let us look at the slide now. The first process that we are talking about, sub process that we are talking about is called project initiation process, but there is a prelude to this. Since an organization never does a project in isolation, the organization has to manage a portfolio of projects. The organization has to manage a portfolio of projects and there are several projects that the organization is performing at the same time. So, as a prelude to studying the project initiation process, we need to study how does the organization really select its project portfolio. Once we have done that, the next particular process is the scope planning process. Scope planning process is where the details of the product to be produced are understood. This is followed by the scope definition process, where the project scope is put down in writing in a pre specified format. Any job is really not done until you have undertaken the verification for the work done. If you remember yesterday's analogy of falling from the first floor versus rolling down the staircase, we must do some work. So, always understand, define and verify. So, the fourth particular scope involves scope verification. Okay. Last, but not the least is the scope that we have defined is never going to remain constant. The scope that we have defined is never going to remain constant and as such we will have to control the changes to the scope. Now, we will look at all these five sub processes in more detail. For instance, typically an organization justifies IT and IS projects based on several considerations. Okay. Uh, for instance, there may be explicit business objectives which need to be achieved. Okay. Similarly, there may be some implicit business objectives to be achieved. You know. So, this may include that we would like to provide a kind of a service level to the customers. Okay, and we say if the service level is to be provided, you know, then the corresponding documentation must also be equally good. Another particular reason for justification is response to competitive systems. You know, if your organization is challenged by some competitor, then you may be required to come out with variety of other systems, you know, that will cope with it, you know. 
dot com companies and e business has given a good series of responses in this particular direction. There are other reasons for justifying the projects like management decision making. Sometimes you may want to have a decision support system for supporting the organization's top brass. Many, many other things are there, legal and government requirements, technical requirements for the systems, you know, good internal rate of, these are all commercial kind of a internal rate of return, you know, net present values, reasonable payback, you know, for the investment that is made, okay. And there may be other considerations like a high probability of achieving the benefits, okay, in the specified time. Now, what happens is an organization cannot take all projects at the same time. So, you know, like you say you will take some good and some bad, you know, like it may take some small projects and it may take some large projects, it may take some risky projects and it may take some safe projects and it may take those projects which have to be done and it may also take some also ran kind of projects, okay. So, that variety of reasons, you know, why organization undertakes project. So, the set of projects which is selected for being performed or particular undertaken is what is called a project portfolio, okay. So, basic premise behind project portfolio management approach is to collectively evaluate all the applications in the portfolio to study their impact on the organization, okay. So, the balancing is done on a variety of considerations like project size experience with the technology, support to strategic role, okay, centralized versus end user computing, risk versus payoffs and user proficiency in, you know, tackling the situation, okay. So, an organization chooses a variety of projects to balance its overall requirement, to balance its overall requirement, okay. Now, how does the organization select these particular projects in the portfolio? That is based on generating a wide variety of alternative solutions to each of these particular projects and then comparing which particular solution is best in the interest of the organization, okay. So, the feasibility analysis starts with generating alternative solutions, okay. The solutions ranging from complete automation to complete manual activity. Similarly, creativity and imagination, you know, will be the cornerstones for coming out with these particular solutions. Once we have identified some alternative solutions, you know, the project manager is required to make reasonable estimates about various resources required for doing this particular project also needs to provide confidence that the system will work if the resources were provided and it needs to give an indication as to how the system will fit in the organizational's overall plans, okay. So, for instance, what technology will be needed, what will be the social implications of introducing this particular system. Okay? The, now, what you need to remember is the operational details of each project are not very important at this particular stage. Once you have prepared this particular alternatives, the next thing that you are going to do is to compare them. Now, obviously, you cannot use only one yardstick for comparison and you will have to consider several alternative ways of comparing these particular projects. And again, one might want to take a weighted average of these particular alternative ways of evaluation to come out with the final decision about what should and should not be included in the project portfolio. Typical basis for comparing the alternatives are for instance equivalent worth methods, you know, how much money are you going to spend every year. You might take the approach of present worth or you might take the approach of future worth also. In the present worth approach, what you will find out is, if you are going to spend so much money every year for the next so many years, what is the present value of that particular money, you know, and then do the comparison. Another particular approach is to find out how much is going to be the return on investment, you know, how much you are investing, how much are you getting it back and how much you will really make. And many organizations stipulate 
that you will not undertake a project unless you have so much return on investment at minimum. Other particular approaches are discounted cash flows, you know, then payback periods. One can also do a sensitivity analysis. For instance, suppose we make a particular assumption and this particular assumption deviates a little bit. Uh, total sales, for instance, instead of being say 10,000 units, you know, turns out to be 9,500 or 9,000 or 11,000 or 6,000 or 15,000 kind of a situation. What will be the impact on our decision? Okay. Other techniques like break even analysis, treatment of risk, you know, like some organizations are more risk prone, others are not. So, you might look at the utility functions as well. You may also consider things like make or buy decisions you know, whether it makes sense to make it rather than buy what is available. And another useful approach is the charge out approach. So, what do you do? Depending on who is the user who is using this particular project, you know, he pays for the use of the project's product. Okay? So, you say, what is the value of the service that this project's product will produce and provide to the user, you know, to the user. So, these criteria can be used to find out how we can do the allocation. Now, look at the slide for instance. Suppose an organization wishes to consider, you know, several projects. Okay. So, you have the billing ordering consolidation project and a product line reporting project and sales forecasting project and sales customer analysis project and you know, job production scheduling, financial modeling, you know, factory computer aided manufacturing application and the truck loading application. Again, look at the slide, you know, you might want to compare these projects based on considerations like return on investment, risk, impact on the business, you know, demand from the customers. Okay? and take some kind of a weighted number to come out with the overall favorable or unfavorable situations for the project. Then we could do some detailed analysis and look at this particular results. So, in this analysis, it looks like you know that the billing and the ordering consolidation, you know, project has a rating of 43. Obviously, these particular projects have been rank ordered already for decision making, you know, and it is clear from this that you will have to select some projects from the top of this particular list for implementation and to be included in your project portfolio, to be included in your project portfolio. There are also other ways of looking at this particular thing, you may may not be interested in looking at only the quantitative aspects of the project's feasibility or desirability, in which case again you can take another approach. For instance, look at this polar chart, look at this polar chart. You know, here we have considered only four dimensions, risk, profitability, commercial success and time to market, you know, and we have drawn you know different particular projects profile with different lines you know and it shows you that the particular project with this particular project for instance seems to be having the maximum area and covering the reach you know in all the four directions covering the reach in all the four directions of course this may not be very good for doing the selection, but it gives you at a glance perfect idea about which particular projects are candidates and what are their dominant sort of uh, strong points, you know, for selecting them. Okay? So, once we have done this particular kind of a activity, you know, that the project portfolio has been selected. Then we come down to one specific project, that is where really our subject starts okay? and we say that we need to now initiate this particular 
project, we need to initiate this particular project. Okay. So, what is really the purpose of this particular project initiation? To begin with, it is to confirm that the assigned project okay, is achievable within the specified framework. So, you say yes, it can be done. Okay. Then formally authorize the new project. Okay. So, we say this particular project has company has decided to take this particular project up for development you know, in the next whatever the specified period. It also is aimed at specifying exactly what the project will produce or achieve. It needs to adequately specify the requirements for undertaking the project planning activity. Mind you, the details of the requirement will have to be finalized little later, but at this particular stage, you will need to specify the requirements in adequate detail, so that the project planning activity can begin. Also, the you know broad idea is required about the quantum and the kind of resources that you required for undertaking this particular project. To also to establish a basis for how this particular project success will be judged, you know, because we do not want to find out at the end of the project whether it was successful or not. We would like to check throughout the life of this particular project and to find out whether the project is running on the right course. So, control mechanisms will have to be also specified. Then we have very important particular thing and as we have already seen the an organization does not you know run in vacuum, it runs as a part of a performing organization. So, obviously, from that particular point of view, okay, so linking of the current project to the ongoing activities of the performing organization is very essential. Okay. Last but not the least, when we announce the project, we would like to bring together the team members okay, with a view to make sure that we get their commitment for doing the project. Remember, neither the project manager nor individual team members okay, have been selected only for their preference. It is the organizational's preference in allocating these particular people to this particular project. Okay. It is very necessary that these people, you know, whatever their initial reservations that may be to doing and working on this particular project, they need to be overcome and you need to give them a team spirit, whereby they will say, yes, we would like to do this particular project. So, all these particular things need to be achieved with the project manager's particular in a project initiation process, project initiation process. How do we go about doing this? So, the first thing during project initiation that the project managers need to do is to question everything. Literally, what we mean is question everything. Now, look at the slide. An IT project manager, for instance, needs to check that the management has given him a particular project. Is it valid, you know, all the resources adequate, is the time specification, you know, correctly done. Okay. Who are the vendors going to be supplying to this, who are the other managers and the team members who are going to be working on it. Okay. What kind of support is required for this particular project, you know, what talents or the skills will be required for doing this. Okay. Similarly, we need to question each and every aspect, do not take anything for granted as a project manager, when you are beginning to take a project, you are taking over a project. Remember, what we are doing is you are taking over a project and when you take over a project, you know, you need to take, make sure that before you take this particular project up, there are no doubts in your own mind about the possible success of this particular project, possible success of this particular project. Okay. So, you questioned everything that you can and you found that okay, for you know you get a reasonable answers to all these particular questions. Then you start looking at the project itself. So, now you have taken charge of the project in a true sense, you know psychologically you are willing to stick your neck out and say yes, I will get this particular project done. So, the, what, do you, what is the next thing that you do? 
Now, next thing that you must do is to identify all the project's stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? Stakeholders are all those people who are affected because of the project. Stakeholders are all those people who are affected by the project. They may have affected either directly or indirectly. You know, one of the fears that has always stopped all the IT projects is it will result in eliminating manpower, which of course, many studies have shown is not true. Okay. Similarly, the stakeholders may be affected, you know, uh, you know, in terms of various positive or negative manner and this you need to keep in mind. So, any project really needs to balance between the expectations of the stakeholder. This is especially true because interests of different stakeholders are often conflicting. You know, it is like uh, you know, suppose you try to introduce an octroi management system at the octroi naka, you know, then lots of people are going to be affected because of this particular decision. It is no different from trying to introduce, uh, you know, a, 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 a small system in say Chitay Bandhu Mithai Wale shop in Pune. Okay, the customers as well as all the workers and the managers and the top men all are going to be the stakeholders in such a project. Okay. Now, the stakeholders can also be classified as internal and external. You know. So, the internal stakeholders are you know typically the sponsors, the project staff, the support staff, the top management you know and all the other people working within the organization. And typical external stakeholders are the customers or external sponsors of the project, the suppliers, the regulatory agencies, the competitors you know and of course, the society at large, the society at large. Okay. Now, look at the slide. Now, the slide shows you typical stakeholder analysis in a simplistic manner. Here, we have Mr. Rajendran. Okay. So, the Rajendran is basically a member of the management, is an internal sponsor, is a company director, is you know unique facts about him are like he is very demanding, you know likes details as a business focus and he has done you know a master's degree from IIM. Okay. His level of interest in the project is very high and his influences are very high and you know suggestions for keeping mentoring him are that he likes to be you know keep him informed you know let him lead the discussions and quickly do what he says. Okay. So, you look at Nayan, he is another girl working on our particular project you know she is a team member, she is a lead programmer obviously, he is the best programmer that we got you know he is very easy to get along and she has a very good sense of humor and her interest also in the project is very high. Okay. Having been with us for a long time, she has a good influence in the organization and this is very important, she is very hard to replace. So, we would like to make sure that we keep her as long as we can. Okay. So, keep her happy, so that she stays okay. and of course, on a lighter side we also specified that she needs some Mexican food, likes Mexican food or something like that. We have another details about somebody like Jagdish, who is a hardware wonder, who is going to do supplies for our particular project. He okay. is a you know somebody who has been in his line for a long time, nice elderly gentleman settled you know to him your project is one of the projects that he is supplying to. So, his interest is reasonable you know, but you know like he is not the really you know so running after your particular project. Uh, his nature requires that you give him adequate lead time to deliver you know and though he takes a back seat, 
but there is a lot of things that you can learn from him in view of his large experience, in view of his large experience. Okay? So, now we do a stakeholder analysis. Now, it is a very tricky situation. In many cases, you may not be in a position to put the stakeholder analysis on a piece of paper and circulate it and put it on the notice board. But as a project manager, it is very essential for you to get a good thinking done in this particular area. You know, good thinking done into who are the stakeholders and how you would like to tackle them. Once we got the stakeholder idea, now we need to make sure the first thing that you would like to do is to be very clear about what are the objectives that the project is supposed to achieve, most importantly. Okay? So, you say a project without clear goals cannot succeed. Why? For a simple reason, you know, it will not achieve the goals that are required because we do not know it, you know, you cannot achieve it. It may achieve some goals which really are not required, you know, again does not really count towards the success, you know, or achieve the goals which have already been achieved. So, we are duplicating the effort, somebody has already done it somewhere and you are doing it all over again. So, you say, you know, the projects need a very clear goal. Okay? So, the project objectives may be classified as a hierarchy also. So, the top level hierarchy, you know, will be broad details, you know, and then you will have to go on specifying these objectives to a level where they are ultimately measurable, the level they are very measurable. Okay? So, you have system level objectives, you have functional objectives and you have at the last quality objectives to be achieved by the project. Similarly, critical project attributes for a particular project can also be specified. So, we will say, what are the critical attributes? We say critical attributes are those attributes which if not achieved, you know, the product will be deemed to be a failure. The product will be deemed to be a failure. The project will be of no use. And take a simple example. Suppose, you are having a CSI convention in Bombay and you are required to develop a CSI conference registration system and your system is going to be ready two weeks after the CSI convention is over, you are having a problem on hand. But we know from our experience that lots of projects get delayed well beyond two weeks, you know, and fine, nothing seems to happen. A payroll project, for instance, gets delayed by two weeks, you know, nobody is going to uh, really, you know, bring the heaven and earth together. So, you say critical attributes are those which the project must achieve, you know, and the other attributes to a different degree of level need to be achieved, you know. Usually, there are product attributes which are critical and there are project attributes which are critical, you know, reliability and speed may be like the product attributes, whereas the quality, cost and schedule may be grouped as the project attributes which are important. Now, let us take an illustration. Look at the slide. One of the hospitals wanted to develop a hospital information systems. So, what objectives did they have in mind? So, the first and foremost, the objective was to make available wherever required integrated real time information about the patients, of course, to all concerned. The second particular objective was okay, to help in optimizing the sharing of hospitals resources across various departments. This particular aspect is very important, please note. Okay. Many times the information is generated and kept in one department and it is not very easily available to other departments. Look at the third particular objective of this particular hospital in automating, to relieve the hospital staff from repetitive and clerical work. Have you not heard of social work agencies where social, trained social workers spend two thirds of their time in pen pushing rather than going and doing social work in the field, you know, meeting the children or, or aged people or whatever they do, you know, because the system makes a lot of demands on this particular kind of activity. So, to relieve the hospital staff from repetitive and clerical work is very major objective from this hospital's point of view. 
another particular objective to assist in education of hospital staff on an ongoing basis okay, by providing an overall view of the hospital's healthcare system and its organization. You know, uh, it is very important that we train people as close to reality as possible without really having to uh, you know actually work in the field without experience and then learn by making mistakes. Okay. So, training of people is a very important issue with all the organizations okay. and this particular training can be done to a large extent also by sharing information that is available, that is accumulated okay, by the organization over periods of time. Last, but not the least, to provide the hospital management with a tool for measuring the costs and performance of its activities. Now, remember in the past there has been a misconception that the charity hospitals, hospitals usually you know were often sort of started by charitable institutes that costs and performance are not their key judging factors. That is very wrong. See, cost is the other side of resource consumption. So, you say resource consumption and costs are two sides of the same coin. And a hospital may be a charitable organization and it may not be wanting to cost and price, you know, its services, but it is very essential for it to realize how much resource is being deployed in the end product that it is producing. Okay. So, these particular objectives, you know, as they are specified, you know, by the University Hospital of Geneva in Switzerland, you know, I am sure many organizations produce this particular type of documents. So, once we got the objectives in mind, now what we need to do is to make a big bang announcement, okay, that this particular project is going to start. So, the project initiation process, the next thing it does is to authorize the new project that we are undertaking. Okay. What it means is the top management is endorsing the decision of the proposing management to undertake this particular project. Okay. So, the measuring the usefulness of the product to the project's owner choosing between alternative solutions and optimizing under the given circumstances, all this has been done and now this needs to be endorsed by the top management. So, after senior management decides to undertake this particular project, okay, it is essential that the rest of the organization knows about this particular decision. There are many different ways in which this decision is communicated down the line to everybody in the organization. One particular approach is to produce a document called project charter. Of course, please remember a project charter by any other name, you know, would still mean the same particular thing, basically announcing the arrival of a project. Okay. So, project charter is the most frequently used document that authorizes the commencement of the selected project in the organization. What does this do? Once you have selected this particular project, this project needs to be linked to the other aspects in the performing organization. You know, it needs to integrate with the external aspects, the internal integration within the particular, it must integrate with the planning framework of the organization and the control framework of the organization. Okay. So, the project charter plays a very important role. Let us now look at some of this particular aspect. Okay. So, let us look at some of this particular aspects. This is an illustration of a project charter. This is an illustration of a project charter. Okay. Now, what do you see here? You start with, you know, by putting a name. So, so, you say our particular project is termed OS upgrade XP and 2000 servers sponsor is Arun Rajay, he is the chief executive officer, you know the team members are Chandru who is a network administrator, 
and his team consists of Shashi, Jagdish, Pankaj and Jolene. The project goals are that all the desktops in the organization will be upgraded to Windows XP by 3rd December. Windows 2000 will be put on 6 new servers that we are planning to buy by 20th of December and all existing servers in the organization will be upgraded to Windows 2000 okay, by that same date. Now, let us proceed further. What does it say? You need to make a business case for this particular project. So, they say business Windows 95 has served the company for the last 5 years. It has been decided now to shift to new technology from Microsoft, which is similar, but far superior to Windows 95. Windows XP will make us more productive, more mobile and more secure. This will also enable us to introduce in future excellent techno technologies, which can run only on Windows XP. It will also be in keeping with our orientation of keeping the web presence. Okay on the www uh, world wide web and also serve you know all the servers will have to be upgraded to this particular the thing. Then it is very important for us to specify what are the time deadlines, how the progress will be managed, you know what will be done in September, what will be done in October, what will be done in November, what will be done in December, what budget is required you know, what test facilities are required, what educational, con for instance, our educational consultant is a company called Software Mart India Limited, Software Mart India Limited. Okay? So, this kind of a details will have to be specified in the project charter. So, project initiation process basically comes out with outputs like first the project charter. Okay. Second, it also might bring out a list of constraints. These are the factors which limit the project team's options. It will also list all the assumptions that have been made and the basis on which you know the project is going to be implemented and identification of a project manager. Please remember, earlier you assign a project manager to this particular job, you know, the project, you know, the better is the chance of survival of this particular project, somebody to take ownership of this particular project at the earliest. Okay? So, this will bring us to the end of project initiation, but project initiation really never gets completed in a true sense unless we do a little bit of a formal tom tom about it, you know what is called a project kick off. Okay? So, if you have a formal project kick off. Okay. It will get you know so much better response from the organization. What are the purposes it will serve? First of all, it will introduce the project manager and the team members to each other. It will also help in creating a team spirit up front. It will also help formulate a op give a open environment, you know, an opportunity for fair exchange of technical issues in the about this particular project to achieve common understanding about the project's requirement, to get a commitment from the team, to demonstrate the management's backing to the project. For instance, who attends your project kickoff will, you know, uh, really go down in the grapevine of the organization to say how important this project is to the organization. Okay? So, the project kickoff needs to be well organized. You know, you need to invite the management and the other stakeholders, you need to set a stage, you need to specify the purpose, get all the involved people together and highlight the financial budgetary commitments that the organization is making and that is it. You are all ready to begin your project, you are all ready to begin your project. Let us now go to the second sub process in scope management that is the scope planning and definition process. Scope planning and definition process is aimed at, note that 
progressively elaborating, not one time, progressively elaborating and of course, documenting the work that needs to be done to produce the product. Okay? So, it develops documents which will form the basis for all the subsequent project decisions, all the subsequent project decisions. Okay? So, criteria for completion of a project or a phase of a project what are the estimated costs, what are the schedules, what are the resources, what is the baseline for monitoring and controlling the projects, what measurements are required, you know how they are to be done, what information needs to be communicated up and down the organization okay? and clarity in assigning roles and responsibilities to different people who are associated with the project. Okay? And last but not the least, you know, evolve a common understanding for the project scope amongst all the stakeholders. So, the scope planning and definition process really is at the heart of the project scope management activity. It will result in some kind of a work breakdown structure being produced. Understand, we will talk now a lot of breakdown structures. The work breakdown structure will tell you what different activities need to be performed, you know, to complete the project. Similarly, later on we will talk of deliver deliverable breakdown structures, which will say what things will be physically delivered to the either the internal or the external clients of the project. Okay? So, first let us look at a typical work breakdown structure. Okay. So, look at this particular slide, we have you know an internet project and at level 1 we need to do say 5 activities, you know, conceptualize the project, do a website design, then develop the website according to the design, then do a rollout and provide an ongoing support for our site. Now, each of these particular tasks, each of these tasks at the first level can be further defined at the second level. Okay. So, look at the concept part of it. So, first we do is evaluate the current system then define the requirements for our particular project, then define the risk management approach for our project, then we develop a project plan for performing the project and we do a briefing for the development team. We will need to do a similar decomposition for website design, website development activities, the rollout and the support activities. Now, you can extend this particular idea to one level further or as many levels further as required. In this particular case, we have drawn up a third level breakdown structure, you know. So, we say how do we define the requirements? So, you say define the user requirements, define the content requirements, define the system requirements, define the server requirements. Please remember, defining requirements is the most difficult task in any project. Defining the requirement is always the most difficult task in any project and from that point of view, you know, we need to have all the stated requirements, all the implied requirements, all the legal requirements, all the exotic requirements that you may have, you know. And these particular requirements do not all come from the same source. So, we need to go to different people to get their requirements and then reconcile the conflicts that may arise in these particular requirements and specify the requirements. So, in this particular way, we have defined how this particular job will be done at the third level. And as I already mentioned earlier, each of the other particular tasks at second level need to be further defined to a third level and subsequently to a lower level if required. So, when we have done 
our scope planning and definition process activity, what outputs do we get? So, the first output we get is a document called the scope statement, sometimes it is also known as statement of work. Especially if you are subcontracting a particular project, then the statement of work is a very important document, statement of work is a very important document. It directly or indirectly refers to the product, its objectives, its justifications and its deliverables. Okay. It is also possible to have multiple scope statements okay, to match different levels of the work breakdown structure. So, you may define the scope statement in detail in keeping with the levels in the work breakdown structure. In this particular statement, please remember, though we make it now, is going to be revised on an ongoing basis. So, you know, do not consider this as the final, but all the same, at this point of time, you need to put down in writing whatever the project is supposed to be doing in a document called the scope statement. Now, since this particular scope is going to be, you know, tracked throughout the life particular of the project, you know, this scope management plan will have to be prepared. A scope management plan will describe how the project scope will be managed. This includes how to bring about the possible changes that might in course of time come for this particular project. It also describes how the scope changes will be identified, classified and incorporated. Please understand this. The changes will keep coming, you know, without any predefined kind of a distribution, you know, it just comes whenever some, you know, somebody changes the requirements or some errors are discovered, or conflicts are discovered, you know, the change will come. So, the those changes come as and when they sort of are deemed necessary, incorporating those changes within the scope statement, you know, has to be done in a planned manner. That is why the scope management plan tells you how to bring about these changes, you know, in the project scope. Last but not least, you know, several supporting details like assumptions and constraints will also be there, you know. Every time you are doing any particular job, the job is always going to be done based on certain constraints and certain assumptions, you know, and it is very necessary for you to prepare an appendix all the time, you know, to say what are the assumptions and what are the constraints under which the current decisions have been taken, current decisions have been taken. Okay? So, we initiated the project, then we defined the project. Now, what we need to do is to verify that this particular definition is correct. Now, please realize this, we are not looking at the scope verification process as a quality control activity. Quality control activity, you know, may also have an objective to verify the scope that is defined, but in our case, the objective of the scope verification process, okay is to bring an acceptance, bring an acceptance of the project sponsor to the scope as is defined. Okay. Please remember this, the quality control is an internal requirement, whereas the bringing the acceptance is a project's requirement of a different type. Okay. So, scope verification that we are talking about is very different from quality control activity, which might involve for instance, review of the scope definition. Okay. So, this processes of scope verification and quality control reviews may often be performed together okay, to ensure, because both are achieving different uh, particular, di achieving different objectives, but the activity that is involved may be similar. So, scope verification process is aimed at obtaining a formal acceptance of the project scope by the stakeholders. 
a vague or a broad scope, you know, might result in, for instance, scope creep. What is a creep? That is a gradual increase in the coverage of the project, you know, because some ends were left loose. Okay. So, in case you have such open end, open sort of loose ends and the scope is not defined and then subsequently verified, you may have very frequent changes to the scope. So, our objective is to make the scope statement as good and as acceptable as possible and make sure that subsequently the number of changes are kept to a minimum and whenever they occur, they are brought about into the scope statement in a controlled kind of a manner. So, the scope verification process has a formal output and that is the acceptance of the scope definition by the stakeholders, by the stakeholders. Okay. Now, once we have got this verification, we must make sure that requirements management is a very important activity that we will have to perform throughout the life of the project. The requirements as specified in the scope, you know, will not be the same ones that are met at the end of the project and the requirements will keep on changing from that point of view over the life of the project. So, you say, what is really the purpose of requirements management in this context? So, you say, we say, if you have a proper requirements management, then it will ensure that the requirements are defined properly, that is, even the simplest of the needs are documented. Then those requirements are understood uniformly by all concerned. That means, the customer, the developer, the testers, the third parties must understand the same thing from what is documented. Okay. These requirements need to be agreed, validated and accepted by all the stakeholders. So, obviously, the conflicts that may exist in these particular requirements will have to be eliminated before that and last but not the least, the requirements will have to be maintained and controlled. Okay. So, once we have done this particular kind of a job, you know, it will help us a lot in subsequent implementation of the project. So, we will be periodically be able to confirm that the changes that we have, you know, have been agreed upon, you know, any negotiations that might be required have been done okay, and any changes to the baselines have also been performed. So, all these particular activities will have to be done. So, we come to the next sub process and that is the scope change control process. Okay. Scope change control process says that the changes to the requirement are inevitable. Those changes may be because of the customer's initiation. Take instance that if the state government was to change the tax laws, you know, then the corresponding changes will have to be made to the payroll system. You know, it's a customer initiated change which you can't really do away with. Similarly, the developers may initiate changes. Usually, the developer initiated changes are as a consequence of the errors detected. You know, whenever an error is detected, some kind of a corrective action needs to be taken. So, the developer particular thing. And of course, there could be changes which might be because of the, you know, project products environment that you are producing. You know, like in the middle of your development effort, if the new version of uh, you know, OS or RDBMS or some compiler or some tool was to be introduced and you may like now to change the scope of your project to incorporate this new technology. Okay. So, there are variety of reasons why these particular changes will be there. The change control process, you know, is directed at controlling the changes. Okay. Many projects fail because the changes to the scope are in an uncontrolled fashion. Changes to the scope are uncontrolled. Okay. So, we say in brief, the scope change control process is concerned with influencing the factors that cause the scope changes. Obviously, we would like to keep the number of changes to the scope to a minimum. Next, whenever 
these changes are proposed, agreeing upon the scope changes as to what will and will not be changed. Okay. Please remember, every suggested change need not necessarily be you know, implemented. Let us take an example. Suppose, we have a ABC categorization of changes. You have a car and the car does not work. You know, it is a A category problem needs to be solved immediately. Suppose, the horn or the headlights are not working. You, know, you have a system that is working, but in a curtailed fashion and it is not fully fit. You know, maybe a car without headlights cannot be driven at night or a car without horn cannot be taken to Buleshwar area, you know, where the pedestrians are in plenty on plentiful on the roads. Okay. But all the same, the car works and then take the C category changes like a scratch on the paint and you will say, yeah, you know, we are not going to go to the mechanic, you know, for getting this particular car done up or the repair garage to get the car done up immediately. Whenever the car goes for repair next time, you know, we will also get this small things done. The same analogy can be done with a software project. Okay. So, you have a situation where a product, you know, have crashes, you know, it is a A category problem. If you find that, you know, there is a performance issue involved and, you know, if the number of users at any one point of time logged, you know, in some manner will go beyond a certain level, you have a problem. You know, it is a B category problem or you may know that a particular function is not working very well. So, you say, please do not use that function. The rest of the system is equally usable, B category problem. You have a C category problem where there may be a spelling mistake in the screen okay? and obviously, this mistake, you know, need not really initiated, you know, bringing about a new version of the whole product. You know, this can be taken care of whenever you are, you know, making other changes to this or similar kind of program. Okay. So, agreeing upon the scope changes and managing the actual changes when they occur, you know, managing is very important. You always had this problem that a change was incorporated, but somebody overwrote that particular change and, uh, you know, the old version of the file was again retrieved, recovered or incorporated in the build sequence of a product, you know, and the change which you apparently made uh, does not reflect in the final product. Now, remember this, the scope change control that we are talking about also needs to be integrated with the other change control processes. In the integrated integration knowledge area that last we have, we have a process called overall change control. Okay. So, the overall change control integrates between changes to everything. For example, take a simple example, suppose I was to change the scope of my project it may affect the changes to quality, it may affect changes to cost, it may affect changes to uh, schedule and so on and so forth. So, you cannot make a change to the scope without making corresponding changes also to other knowledge areas. Okay. So, scope change control process acts by itself and it also integrates with the other change control processes in the organization, other change control processes in the organization. Now, before this being a very important point, before we go further, you know, let me highlight, you know, some suggestions which are made by experts to minimize the changes to a project scope. Please remember, though the changes are not avoidable, you know, they can definitely be minimized. Okay. So, what are the suggestions? First, develop a good project selection process. Develop a good project selection process. Include the users, you know, in almost all decision making, you know, co-locate the users with the developers, you know, so that the familiarity between the two will avoid misunderstandings, you know. Use techniques like prototyping, joint application development or, you know, if you are a rational rose user, you know, use cases kind of approaches to clearly understand the requirements. Okay. The more you invest in understanding the requirements, there are less chances of there being changes to the scope later on. Okay. 
So, these stakeholders and various stakeholders and the developers, if they are brought close to close to each other, you know, then the chances of any changes due to misunderstanding are likely to be less. Next important thing is to put all requirements in writing, keep those things current and have them readily accessible. Do not put the requirement document under a safe key, so that nobody can look at it and say it is a very important document signed by the client and from that point of view cannot be touched by you know the ordinary and the mundane people working on the project. No. Okay. Extensively use case tools, you know, for getting the requirements and subsequently, you know, generating the, the uh, what you call implementing the project based on this particular requirement. Not a very successful approach, but one approach also is to make the user sign off, you know, things whenever the documents are produced. Please remember, this particular suggestion has only a limited uh, application because you know, if you, if the user is totally unaware of your way of writing, describing, and specifying things, he may just either not sign or sign the document without really understanding it. Okay. Also, you make sure that the deliverables to the project are delivered on a regular basis, then you have periodic meetings with the users, you know, then do the testing throughout the life cycle, make the project information available to all concerned, develop and follow a requirements management process, evaluate the change request, you know, have some kind of a uh, change control board, you know, which will look at impact analysis of each particular change before it is made. Okay. So, these suggestions will help you in minimizing the changes and obviously, if the changes are minimized, then the scope change control process will work very well. What are the typical outputs from a scope change control process? Okay. First is scope changes. These are the agreed please underline the word agreed documentation, uh, what you call agreed modifications, you know, to the scope, which are documented and which are fed back into the planning process and they are intimated to all the stakeholders. Okay. So, when you make a change, make sure that it is documented, it is approved, authorized, then you make changes to the plan and intimate all concerned that the change has been made. So, the results you know, will be very obvious from that. The second is the corrective action. Sometimes, the changes are due to an error and once you detect these particular errors, you might want to correct the output that has been generated, but also correct the process, you know, that generated the wrong output in the first place. Let us take a simple example. So, we have a process which is aimed at doing a third normal form analysis and your first normal form says that in case you have a repeating group, okay, separate the repeating group with a new key which consists of a compound key of the parent group's key plus the key of the separated group, fine, works fine. Now, if you while doing this particular job, you are encounter a situation where you have nested repeating groups. Now, you know the process is silent about it. So, what you will do? You will say, okay, how do I solve nesting situations in other times, you know, like if statements or do statements. And I always tackle the innermost, you know, loop first and then the outermost one. And using the same particular approach, you have to take the repeating group and take the innermost repeating group and separate it out as a relation and then separate out the outer repeating relation, repeating group as a relation, you will find that you have made a mistake, you know, and the correct way of doing it is in case you have nested repeating group, then remove the outermost repeating group first as a separate relation and then from this new relation, remove the repeating second level repeating group as another relation. So, fine, you first time you do the project, you do this mistake and then the, during the review or somewhere down the line, somebody pointed out the mistake and you went and made correction to the normalization that you did to the product. 
but now you also need to go and make a normalization process modification. You need to take a corrective action, okay, so that the process is also modified and any subsequently, if anyone is encountered, encounters this kind of a situation, that person will not repeat the same mistake again. So, you have a scope changes, then you have corrective actions. You may also have to adjust the baselines. We will see subsequently during the configuration management, what is the baseline. It is a collective, you know, group of version control items together known as a baseline. Okay. So, you have a baseline documents okay, and all these particular baselines will need to undergo changes whenever you have made a change. And last but not the least, you know, the lessons learned from any of the exercises that you have done must also be fed back into the organizational system. Okay. So, these are the various outputs from the scope change control process. Let us now summarize what we have talked so far. Scope, look at the slide now. The scope management sub processes are first the project initiation process, which is preceded by project portfolio selection. Then you need to do the planning and the definition of the product that you are producing. Once you have done the planning and the product definition, then you need to verify the defined scope of the project and here we mean not do the quality control activity that can also be done, but mainly get approval of the sponsor that the scope as you have defined in the document is consistent with what they had in mind and last but not the least have a scope change control process in place, which in turn integrates with the overall change control process of the project integration knowledge area. Thank you.